I'm Rachel Oakley and I'm the Partnership Officer for Wild Ennerdale and here we are in the amazing Ennerdale Valley which on a day like today in early November with the sun shining at last because it's been so wet is absolutely uh, fantastic so we've got the backdrop of the fells behind us in the forest um, and you can hear Windlebeck in the distance which is which is lovely so it's really nice to be out kind of thinking back those thousands of years we've obviously got kind of the the influence of the ice age in the in the mountains behind us and then yeah thousands of years of human influence on the landscape going back prehistoric times through kind of the archaeological surveys the iron age the bronze age um right through to more modern times and that kind of visibility in the landscape is here both in terms of kind of forestry and farming, those kind of economic outputs on the landscape, which has left its mark. And then more recently, in the last two decades, we've been working on this um, partnership approach uh, called Wild Ennerdale. So that brings together the three main landowners in the valley. So Forestry, uh, Forestry England, who are by far the biggest landowner. Uh, the National Trust, and that's land mostly managed through its uh, tenant farmers in the valley. Uh, and then United Utilities, so the water company who own and manage the, the lake and primarily, at the moment, that's the primary water supply for communities on the west coast of Cumbria. Uh, we also have Natural England as a fourth partner who provide, that's more, uh, not a landowner, but um, more in a, an advisory, uh, advisory role, helping with the designated land, but also the non-designated land as well. So that collective brings together the, the kind of formal partnership, if you like, of Wild Ennerdale. But we're not confined by the boundary. We also work with a much wider group of stakeholders, which includes other agencies, but also very much the, the local community too. So collectively, within the landscape, we have just under 5,000 hectares of land, which in, a, in an England context is quite um, a sizeable piece of land. And fundamentally that's what Wild Ennerdale's about. It's about moving away from those traditional approaches to managing land determined by who owns what piece of land. So forestry would have focused on trees as a primary product and obviously National Trust through farming. But it's starting to blur those boundaries between who owns what piece of land and also blurring boundaries between how nature works within the landscape. And for me, that's, and for all of us, I think, in the, in the group, that's a really uh, exciting um, and really quite visionary when we first set out 20 years ago to, to think much more that landscape scale more holistically. It's now much more high profile to think like that, whether that's at local level or thinking about government strategy into the future. But back in 20 years ago, that whole kind of concept of wilding, rewilding was nowhere near as high profile as it is today. That term wild in Adele was really just, it, it came about just from talking to people, how primarily how local people felt and how visitors felt about this landscape. So it's not about writing books or campaigning or anything like that or getting press releases. It was fundamentally about how people felt about this place. And a few things that came out of that was the peace and tranquility and that close connection with nature that people felt. Plus that kind of sense that nature is more in control perhaps than other places in the lakes or perhaps other places where you've been to visit, certainly in this country. Um, also the fact that for one of the big Lakeland Valleys, Ennerdale doesn't have a, a main road running through it, that's really important. Uh, so you can walk in relatively traffic free uh, you know, forest tracks or on, on the fells and just, just getting away from that noise of vehicles. No villages, no hotels, no bed and breakfasts up the valley. We've got two youth hostels uh, and a field study centre. But they're, they're kind of very subtle marks on the landscape if you like and crucial for places where people can come and enjoy the valley in the heart of the landscape. Also the processes that are happening in Ennerdale, the, the, the big mountains, uh, the amount of forest that's here, the big river, um, you know, watching the, the kind of weather patterns, the dynamism of it all help contribute to that sense of wild. So that, that question about how, how I think about wild, um, it's really just that lighter touch uh, on, on the landscape, us working in a place 
and being more in tune with what nature is, is doing. That's really what wild is to me. It's not about an ecologically pure approach. We're starting off from uh, a landscape that's been heavily influenced by people and people are crucial to any, to me, to any wilding approach in the UK. It's not, it's not to me wilderness. I think that implies a much bigger scale. Um, and as I said, it's not ecologically pure. We've got lots of, you know, just standing around here behind those trees that might be classed as non-native. But to me, that doesn't really matter. It's about how much that dominates other things from happening um, and the variety that we're starting to see change more into the future. But I think just by thinking more collectively and um, having a shared ambition and vision, that vision that we all buy into about um, more natural processes taking a lead in, in the landscape is really important. So you have people sitting around the same table talking about the same things uh, rather than kind of that piecemeal approach to, to looking after the landscape. So a few things we're starting to do, I still feel like we're in the setup stage of this even though we're 20 years in. When we talk about Wild Ennerdale it, it's not really a partnership, it's more an approach to looking after the landscape. It's very much thinking long term and it's not so much about looking back. Uh, I think sometimes that can be a misconception with the term rewilding that we're trying to create a past landscape. We're not trying to do that at all. It's very much about looking to the future and we tend to use that term future natural. Just thinking about um, the biodiversity and climate emergency and how can we make our landscape more resilient in the face of those really serious kind of challenges. Um, so one of the things we started to do is think about grazing. So we had a landscape very much dominated by sheep grazing and commercial forestry as well. So, and they formed very two distinct patterns on the landscape. So we've got your very harsh conifer boundaries and then you're very um, quite heavily grazed open fell as well. And so by coming together as a collective and importantly working with farmers, we're just starting to blur those boundaries. So we're reducing sheep numbers on the high fells. So sheep are still an important part of the landscape, but not as intensively grazed. We're introducing lower numbers of hardy cattle. So the Galloway cattle, and we've worked very closely with one farmer who's been amazingly supportive of that. Of that. Um, and so we're starting to um, integrate uh, the cattle within the forest. Uh, the forest is starting to move out of its traditional boundaries, if you like. And so those, those boundaries on the landscape are starting, starting to blur, bringing in a new, bigger grazing animal. So that in itself, by having the Galloway cattle, that creates a lot more uh, grain disturbance. It can facilitate tree regeneration. And we're 20 years in now, we're starting to see that happen. We're starting to see these fell sides flourish, which is, which is great. We're gonna to have to think differently about farming in the uplands. And this is, it's a nice case study of, of how you can demonstrate things can be a little bit different without being too radical. The other thing we've learned is how making space for rivers can help our landscapes, can help local communities. And it's been amazing to see how the River Liza has responded in the major flood events that we've had within the last kind of 10 to 15 years in Cumbria. So because the River Liza has a, a relatively good connection with its natural floodplain, it has the space to kind of burst its banks if you like when it needs to. It has big braided river channels. There's lots of vegetation within those river channels. So it's almost like a Velcro landscape that can help to kind of dissipate that energy from, from the river and help to kind of mitigate downstream flooding. So I've never stand here and say the river liza will never, you know, it will stop, it would stop flooding altogether. I would never say that, but I think it's, it's certainly helping it, us to understand how rivers uh, having that kind of freedom to move about and respond to high rainfall can certainly help mitigate against, against flooding. And the other big thing for me I think is developing that understanding of how this landscape works and um, what the aspirations are through sharing our learning with wider audiences whether that's the local community or different groups that come to visit um, and that knowledge is often a two-way thing it's not just about us preaching it's about learning how things are happening elsewhere nationally perhaps internationally uh, but crucially that local support 
uh, is absolutely vital really and has been from, from the start. And you never please everybody all the time, we recognise that, but I think if you can be open and engaging as much as possible right from the outset and admit also that you might not always have the answers but that people have a part to play in influencing the future then you're much more likely to have that support long term and for a, a concept like this to be sustainable into the future. For Wild Ennerdale we, we didn't have an established volunteer group um, and for the last 15 years we've had a really dedicated and enthusiastic group of volunteers. A lot of them are from the local community or out on the coast in West Cumbria or Cockermouth. And they come together, it started off monthly, uh, but it's now weekly and has been for the past kind of eight or nine years, uh, where they dedicate a full day of their time every single week, regardless of weather, apart from the current Covid situations, but up until then they were out weekly and they contribute about 2,000 hours a year, uh, doing all kinds of different tasks and monitoring and they're great advocates within the heart of the community as well. We work quite closely with the Parish Council as well, so uh, we get engaged with their um, Parish Council meetings. So that, um, that kind of information exchange with different groups. I remember when I first came to Ennerdale 25 years ago or so and lived up at the youth hostel for a couple of years and I can remember this area here where we stood being um, really dark, dense, um, large plantation. So you had trees within the landscape, so that's good habitat for birds, um, but you had very little undergrowth, understory growth, it was just, uh, just kind of bare ground and, and needles. And then in the late 90s that was cleared, and in the early 2000s, 2005, 6, we, we introduced the cattle into this site. This was our trial site. And one of the things we hoped the cattle would do uh, was create more grain disturbance to facilitate change. and. One of the things that we hoped was to get more of a, a kind of scrubby, scrubby layer, of more velcroed landscape, if you like. I quite like that term. You're just seeing lots more um, young trees coming through, some birch and hollies, oaks, and also spruce as well and larch. But you know they'd be classed as non-natives, but we don't get too hung up on that. So long as the non-natives aren't dominating. Uh, the broad leaves, if you like, then we don't feel the need to necessarily intervene. Uh, we're also getting lots of um, heathers, uh, we've got juniper coming through, bilberry, you know, the ferns and the lichens. So if you put that together, you get much more of a mosaic of habitat within the landscape. So it's it's nice on the eye, but also it serves a really important function in terms of um, resilience, just thinking about how water is held in the landscape. So where you get heavily grazed open fells, that surface water in high rainfall events will come off the fells very quickly into mountain, tributary, mountain tributaries and then into river valley bottoms and that's where your flooding problems occur. You don't need to do away with grazing altogether, it's about just getting different types of grazing in there. So the Galloways are doing a fantastic job here of kind of triggering new tree growth but also keeping open glades within those treed areas if you like and also facilitating that uh, more grain flora to, to come through. We're seeing an um, increase in numbers of, of birds flourishing in, in Ennerdale and we're doing lots of monitoring on that, um, you know, kind of butterflies and insects so it's all, it's all part and parcel of that kind of nature recovery if you like. For me, it's actually, I should, probably should be saying something like the red squirrel, the iconic red squirrel. I love seeing red squirrels. But for me, in terms of a feature in this valley, it, it's the river, it's standing by or in the River Liza. Because a big thing for me and about wild places is where us as people are kind of made to feel less significant in a place and when nature's in control. And I think the river Liza does that. Uh, the dynamism, the sense of scale, the noise it makes in storm events. But it always runs clear, beautifully clear water, and you very rarely see that in the Lake District. So for me, when I stand there, particularly after a big storm event, I think, wow, this is this is really quite something amazing. And it kind of gives me hope as well um, for kind of future generations and that they can actually see this happening now. You know, I've got young children and you know just thinking about it's, it, there's a lot of negativity out there at the moment in terms of the environment and biodiversity and climate and we need more places 
like in a dale and it's happening but we need to kind of scale that up for the future you could fly over this valley however mode of transport that might be in a hundred years time and you've just got this beautiful interwoven landscape where you don't know who owns what bit of land whoever the landowners might be into the future but it's just it, it, it all kind of sings as one beautifully connected flourishing thriving landscape I find it really a really inspiring process to experience I think that if you're some of it is a bit risk taking but if you're prepared to take those risks and you are you have a kind of a clear goal in mind and a kind of that that willfulness to kind of put your trust in what nature can deliver then it becomes more of the norm in terms of how your organisation might think about what can be achieved. I think people look to Ennardale for for that influence, if you like, because it's a very practically based concept and approach, and that is certainly helping to steer thinking, I think, for, for the future and for, ultimately, na nature and people recovery. You know, people need healthy, vibrant landscapes and, uh, you know, wildlife, rivers. We all need to kind of live together in, in, a, in a healthy and kind of resilient way.